begin okay so first of all hello everyone and welcome to this uh, new uh, series of uh, pk lives making sense of maxillofacial surgeon i from the, the deepest core of my heart would like to uh, thank you all for turning up and uh, listening to uh, what we have to say each time and um, thank you so much once again and welcome into the new year happy new year to all of you now uh, coming to today's session reconstruction and rehabilitation of maxillofacial defects before covid era was mainly in the realm of head and neck cancer surgeons but in the post covid post mucor mycosis times the spectrum of this kind of work has now increased and in today's time an ordinary maxillofacial surgeon like myself is faced with the dilemma of reconstruction of maxillofacial defects as an aware and responsible surgeon i would like to know what are the best choices for my patients and the choices which are backed by evidence and not based on some fancy fads which offer quality of life for our patients and the kind of money that they pay the quest for these questions is the reason for today's session where i have some of the most eminent panelists speakers and a daring darling friend as a moderator dr aditya murthy dr aditya murthy who is graciously accepted my invitation to be the moderator of this session is a well known name a senior consultant with around 20 years of experience in the department of oral and maxillofacial surgery at trustwell hospital rangadore hospital and apollo hospitals bangalore welcome all of you once again to this session dr aditya murthy Uh, thank you, Tarun. That's um, um, more than I can expect from most people. People generally are not uh, kind to me, either to my face or behind my back. But I always enjoy enjoy being on your yeah, sessions. Yeah, and when you yeah. Um, but uh, getting back on track here. uh that's a great initiative taranjit let's get straight into the job see um very honestly i was telling all three of my eminent colleagues that uh, uh, i'm not an implantologist and uh, i honestly didn't know exactly why taranjit tracked me into this but i uh, right now we have figured out exactly what we are going to do i am the moderator so i do not need to know much about implantology or even occlusion for that matter we have got um, uh, three exceptionally gifted uh, clinicians i started with dr pc jacob because he is a guest of sorts but he is part of the family for max fact surgeons if uh, nobody has heard of him um, you should especially if you want to do any kind of um, um, implant rehabilitation he is um, um, uh, name to reckon with purely because of the sheer commitment he has had his ability to work with um, maxillofacial surgeons understand our requirements and more importantly our limitations um i'll uh, come to anjan last Vinay Kumar is a man who's uh, uh, never stopped uh, impressing me. I honestly don't know him very well, but what little I do know of him uh, scares me just a little bit. Uh, he's exceptionally committed to academics, and he's one of the rare academicians who uh, is perfectly capable of uh, um, scrubbing in, uh, wading into the dirt, and uh, getting the job on hand. He is one of those operating scientists, a very rare breed indeed. And incidentally, he operates uh, next door to me. and he never joins me for a cup of tea or even anything stronger anjan anjan's a dear friend um where uh, it it's very difficult to describe anjan because uh, uh, he doesn't leave any stone unturned he, he in the morning he can raise a fibula plumb it in um join me for a great lunch head off put in four zygoma implants six implants and join me for another orbital floor reconstruction doesn't break a sweat uh, i i take two days off after such a thing and anjan's back in his car driving all round I, i i can't even drive 6 kilometers without a driver anjan's uh, an overachiever um, and um, uh, he probably is uh, uh, one of the names to look up to in the field of maxillofacial surgery however one thing about uh, vinay and anjan here is that they are very very competent dentists i will come back to this and uh, i made a quick uh, a note in in my own mind and said it to dr jacob in the morning that let's be very very honest most maxillofacial surgeons are failed mbbs doctors let let's be very honest we all wanted to join mbbs we did not and a lot of us carry that chip on our shoulders but when at the moment we arrive um, in truth as a true clinician is when we embrace our 
roots as dentists and incorporate whatever great things we've learned uh, uh, into our surgical practice, which uh, I've mostly failed at doing because uh, like if people who, who are logged in earlier, they will realize that um, uh, humility is my middle name. But uh, Anjan and uh, Vinay are uh, exceptional examples of this. If there, if there are any younger lot uh, uh, here who's, who are wondering, um, I, what is the question, I think um, the, the, these two are the chaps who you have to keep, keep an eye on and learn from. I'll stop here. The next uh, 90 minutes, uh, I will hand over to uh, these three ex exceptional good speakers. And at the end of it, uh, I think uh, I will discuss a, li a little bit about patient-specific implants, and uh, then we'll have the floor open for discussions. Uh, is that all, Taranjit? Yes, yes, perfectly fine. Let's start with Dr. Vinay. Dr. Vinay is our yes. speaker. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Taranjit, and thank you, Dr. Adi, for such a nice introduction. You've always been kind. And once I did step down to your clinic and you, you invited me for lunch with your wonderful team. And that was really a warm welcome. Uh, and so you've always been kind and thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have a, such a great introduction from you. Of course, it's such a pleasure to be with all the panelists. And uh, thank you all for coming in at, on a Sunday, Saturday evening. The, our presentation among the three of us uh, and with the moderation of Dr. Adi was about uh, the story of evolution of occlusion-based reconstruction. I will share my screen. Uh, could you all, uh, can you see my screen now? Hello? No, we can't. No, no, we can't. Okay, okay. So uh, I'll try to figure You can out. share your screen because I have made you a panelist. Yes, <coughs> I am sharing now. Yes, yeah. Yep, we see you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've decided to break this topic among the three of us. And of course, at the end, the moderation by Dr. Adi, who will give us some challenging cases and perhaps question us on different methods of, uh, of uh, treatment in the future. Uh, the outline of my lecture would be the rationale for occlusion-based reconstruction. Of course, we are talking about the story of how occlusion has become so important in reconstructive surgery. Uh, so the rationale for occlusion-based reconstruction, how do we plan now that we understand that occlusion-based reconstruction is what we should be doing, then how do we plan for that? Uh, I'll first focus on the mandible and most of my talk would be on the mandible. We start with analog techniques and then some digital techniques of planning. Then I talk on occlusion-based rehabilitation maxilla, just too small as an introduction so that uh, Dr. Anjan takes over from there and some take-home messages. I hope to finish this off in 15 minutes time. So I will minimize this. You know, the, the, the evolution of treatment goals has changed over a period of time. If it was in the mid seventies or up till the mid seventies, it was about disease control, about making the patient survive. Then came the era of flaps. And when the era of flaps came in, it was not only about survival of the patient. Of course, that is the most important. Survival is most important. So it doesn't mean that we compromise on that. It, in addition, became restoration of form. And towards the end of this, beginning of this century, from 2000 onwards, they started pushing borders. It's, it was no more about restoration of form, uh, but it was about restoration of function and quality of life. And then now the patient is seen as a center, as the center of treatment, and there are multiple team, teams that are involved in the treatment of one patient. So it's not that it's, a, it's one uh, specialty specific treatment, but rather we have a cooperation of different groups who can ultimately look at the benefit of the patient in the long run. In, yeah. Off late, we have even started now discussing about how do we minimize morbidity? So can we do all of this, improve function, improve quality of life, improve the form, of course, disease control and survival by minimizing morbidity to the patient and decreasing the number of interventions? Can we make the treatment much shorter? Can we give much better uh, uh, quality of life outcomes much faster? So. Uh, how do we really restore function quality of life? Like we are all dentists and I'm really proud to be dentists. I really like my dental uh, background that I've got in addition to my uh, medical background. Uh, we know that implant supported dental rehabilitation following segmental mandibular reconstruction improves quality of life outcomes. 
This is a prospective randomized clinical trial where 129 patients were assessed. So please look at these numbers. It's a real time data that we had done. 129 patients who had reconstruction of the mandible, segmental reconstruction, they were assessed and only 52 could be dentally rehabilitated and who could be enrolled and randomized into the study, out of which, of course, we lost six patients to follow up and analyzed 46 patients. So 129 reconstructions out of which only 46 could get dental rehabilitation. Among these patients, when we checked at the baseline and after dental rehab, irrespective of the treatment arm that they were in, almost all parameters uh, according to EORTC quality of life and according to oral health impact profile 14, almost all parameters improved for these patients, including the most gain was chewing function, of course, their social life was better. They could go and attend weddings and marriages and eat in, in public. Their personal life improved. A huge impact on their psychological disability because till then they, they, they were functionally crippled without eating anything. And of course, the other parts were not really improved in all patients, but still there was, there was no decrease in any of them. So that's how important quality of life uh, outcomes you can get by giving dental rehab with implant-supported dental rehab. Now... Of course, these were all subjective and it was based on questionnaires of the patient and on the mood of the patient, perhaps. And that's that's one um, uh, a comment that we get. But how about objective outcomes? So here we did this study, which has been published in clinical oral implant research, a split mouth study. I recalled all the patients who had half the mandible reconstructed and rehabilitated and half the mandible, three chewing unit units with native mandible. And we gave them a two color chewing gum, which looks like this. It has got a purple color as well as a green color. We asked them to chew on the resected and reconstructed side for 20 cycles, three times. I took it out, I pressed it, scanned it and sent it to Murali Srinivasan, who's in Geneva. He was in Geneva at that time. Now he's uh, the chair of Gero in, uh, in uh, Zurich. So he was blinded. He didn't know which side was what. And 20 sides of normal side. So these are all the patients that we have with the OPG and we sent those and very surprisingly, there was no difference in chewing outcomes in re reconstructed side as compared to the rehabilitated, uh, the rehabilitated side as compared to the native mandible, which means to say the patients could chew as good on the reconstructed with the denture as compared to the native mandible. Of course, we used chewing gums, which are not the hardest of chewing materials. Uh, but that was the only objective outcome that we could do for chewing function at that point of time. So it was not only about subjective outcomes, but clear cut functional outcomes in chewing function can be obtained in reconstruction and implant rehab. And that was a study coming out of India. So you, we have a study coming out of Netherlands where of course um, resources are kind of unlimited as compared to our setting. And even they say that when they checked health-related quality of life after segmental re resection of lateral mandible, they had two groups, free fibula flap versus plate reconstruction. And they clearly said that if dental rehabilitation by means of dental implants is not anticipated in the fibula, then a plate reconstruction with adequate soft tissue remains a suitable technique for reconstruction of these patients. It's a segmental defect of the lateral mandible. So even in very advanced centers, who have a lot of resources and who are up in the game, they themselves feel that if you don't want to put in implants and dentally rehabilitate, there's no need to go in for a bone containing free flap. So that's how occlusion and functional outcomes are really important regarding jaw tumors. This is not a new concept. It has been there around since 2003 is the first report of, of something called as a prefabricated uh, maxillofacial reconstruction by Dennis Rona's group and Jacquerie's group. And they had given 24 patients with three year outcomes in 2003. So I remember as a resident reading this paper and totally getting so inspired by their work. And this, they have started doing this work in about before the turn of the century, towards the end of the turn of the last century. And they've had consistent results where they say that we plan occlusion, we plan teeth, and based on which we do the whole reconstruction. Now, in that situation, when we know that at the end goal of the treatment is to provide patients teeth and chewing function, why do we stage it? Why can't we try and do it in the first stage itself? 
Because if it is a conventional method, you do a, re a resection and reconstruction, you wait for six months, then you go ahead and place an implant, wait for at least six months, uncovering and soft tissue management, which takes three months, and then prosthetics, which take three months. This is, this is the best, best case scenario where you do it all on time. And still it takes about 15 months for the patient to get rehabilitated. If the patient is motivated, if they have not missed appointments, if there are no complications in between and with multiple visits to the hospital. But now when we know that we can give them occlusion much earlier, why do we have to go through all of this? And so I, the beginning of this, uh, like 2010 or 11 onward, we were fortunate to get an ITI grant to, to study these, uh, these patients and how to improve chewing function, uh, where we decided, okay, we can also try and do it primarily at that point of time and have a really long-term cohort study of these groups. In secondary or conventional implant placement, we know the rehabilitation rates are poor. I chose the best 120 patients and out of which only 52 get, could get rehabilitated. There was a large, vast amount of patients who were reconstructed but couldn't get dental rehabilitation because the reconstruction or the disease or the way it was planned was not good enough to get that. So rehabilitation rates are very poor. If you look at literature, it's about 15 to 20%, even in the best centers, if they hadn't planned for an implant-based occlusal reconstruction, only 15 to 20% of patients end up with a successful dental rehab. You need multiple surgical procedures and a long treatment time. Whereas in primary, we can cut short most of this, and there are different methods to do it. We do an analog technique, which was what first we had done in the beginning. It was called denture-based implant placement. And of course, digital techniques by virtual surgical planning. Uh, this is the analog technique where a patient has got a amyloblastoma extending from uh, second molar to second molar. We made an analog of the denture so that we know how the reconstruction should come in. The resection was carried out by the resection team and the analog sits in very well. And the reconstruction was guided by that analog, which re replicated the denture. And the patient gets up with implants and the reconstructed bone in the right position. And implants are placed onto the patient. And that's this patient, when he came to us, you can notice that his second molars had not yet come. His canine and the premolars had not yet erupted. He was about uh, 11 to 12 years of age. And that's him after growth. And he's after 18. Um, and here you can see, he's not chewing a chewing gum, mind you. He's taking a, a, an apple and I'm sure Dr. Jacob will uh, elaborate this case and the prosthetics in detail. And he's chewing a whole apple and he's been able to do this throughout his school life because we gave him implants at the time of reconstruction and planned for the denture at the time of reconstruction. So that's the analog technique. And of course, that's not the best way to do it. Uh, it's a rather crude uh, carpentry way of doing for surgeons. But now with virtual surgical planning and printed solutions, uh, it has been much more easier to plan this. We, and we, we started with our own desktop printer. Actually, We got a grant to get a desktop printer and we started printing and planning our own uh, 3D reconstructions uh, in about 2012 and uh, 2013 time at uh, Narayana Hridayalaya. Of course, Dr. Moni was heading the department at that time. Uh, this is also not new. Virtual surgical planning and printed solutions are not new. I, I proudly present this center paper from Haptics Associated Virtual Planning from Uppsala University, where uh, uh, I represent Uppsala and I'm, I'm still attached out there. One of the first people to get into this. And now you name it at different names. You can call it as fibula join a day. You can name it as one stage functional reconstruction. Uh, different names to it where you can virtually plan the surgery and do a reconstruction. This uh, boy had an osteosarcoma of the mandible, as you can see, and we virtually planned it. Uh, we planned a double bar. Get a occlusal form. And once we virtually planned it, it was all printed out. And these prints were taken to the operation theater. This printing was uh, outsourced to Osteo3 for this particular uh, case. And that's the plan that we had, the resection splint, and we go after the resection according to the plan, the fibula is reconstructed by doing implants and the prosthesis on the feet. We double barrel it and get it in position. And, and here you can see, and all of you, I, I'm happy there are prosthodontists out here. 
Uh, perhaps the rare times when surgeons get, uh, you know, uh, some credit for pro pro from a prosthodontist. Here you can see that the implants were planned and it sits in the central foci of the opposing teeth. So it's in a correct, correct prosthodontically driven position. And the, the patient gets up with a, a denture and that's in six months post-op. And this is in uh, immediately post-op, you can see that the, 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 the reconstruction sits in like a jigsaw puzzle. It's exactly planned and there's hardly a gap in between. So union becomes much better. And that's the him long-term follow-up. I had lost him to follow-up because I wasn't around and I called him about a month back. Uh, we, we have some amount, I'm a, a little bit concerned about the bone loss of this implant, but we have done paleo. We have got an absolutely brilliant periodontist with us who's done paleo. And that's him uh, uh, about six years follow-up uh, when he visited me the last month. Another case of a printed solution in the maxilla where we resect the maxilla and uh, plan it the same way. And for, this was done at my own desktop printer at my home. Uh, so that's why the prints are not of that great quality. And that's the re resection splint. That's the fibula glide with implants, prints, and the printed prosthesis. We go in and resect, take it out. The, we know that the resection was according to the plan and the fibula is uh, harvested. Implants placed in the fibula, osteotomy done, and that's the teeth along with the fibula on the on 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 the donor site. Then goes into the re reconstructed site, and here again you can see it's sitting in the exact occlusal relationship. So we know that this pro this patient is going to get a functional prosthesis, and that's immediate post-op picture of him with the uh, Riles tube in place, uh, prosthetics by Dr. Jacob. And that's him uh, long-term follow-up and he's grown and he again visited me uh, a couple of weeks I back really because we are doing this uh, long, long um, yeah. outcomes. I will, yeah, so here you can see uh, that he's chewing a carrot, uh, which is also not a chewing gum. So mind you, it's quite hard and he's able to functionally, he's able to do uh, follow good functions over a period of time. And this is a long-term follow-up as you can see. Uh, the the fibula has calcified the the pedicle has calcified. If you can appreciate this radio opaque line, which is going through the cheek and onto the neck, and that's the calcification of the bone uh, of the of the pedicle. I'm sorry, calcification of the pedicle, which shows that these are really long term outcomes. Uh, here in the 3D CT, you can start seeing this pedicle. Of course, they they blurred it once it came down to the mandible. But this is long-term eight-year outcomes and the patient is functioning. The pedicle is calcified, but the bone has, uh, has ossified and, and, uh, and united and the patient is able to chew well. Right, now where do we go to the next level of when we have all this kind of virtual surgical planning and, and printing and so on, how do we go on to the next level? There we, we can do a reconstruction with the CAD CAM printed prosthesis we can have a dolder bar as it was done by Felix. Uh, I was really fortunate to work along with Felix uh, and where they planned even the reconstructed bar and made an external fixator uh, for this case. Uh, for an example of this case where the reconstruction plate was extruded, a secondary reconstruction where planning was done. And here on the right hand side, you can see that there is a bar which is already planned in position. A prosthesis sits on top of that. And that's uh, the implant placement and the bar sitting on top and the denture. And this whole thing is reconstructed and whole thing is put inside the mouth. Uh, this was done in about 2014. And here you can see that one level you have the reconstruction plate and on top you have a bar which acts as an external fixator which fixes these segments together. And so the patient can function as early as possible. I'm ending the, towards the end of my presentation where I just show you a very interesting case, how we think, how the concept has perhaps shifted now more to thinking of occlusion-based outcomes, even for the upper jaw. And I'm sure Dr. Anjan is going to talk in detail about this. Uh, this was a case that we did recently about a couple of uh, weeks back, a month back, month back. So I don't have long-term follow-up of this, but it's a zip flap where a patient had a, a, a squamous cell carcinoma in Sri Shankara. Patient was of Dr. Narayana Subramaniam and his team. Uh, I'm the MaxFax in that team. So we they did the resection. That's the resected specimen. And we placed, a, uh, we made a denture beforehand so that we know that this is the denture that the patient is going to get. 
and then uh, implants were placed according to the plan. We first checked the denture fit and then we placed quad zygomas uh, to support this denture, made uh, holes for where the zygomas come out. Here, the fourth zygoma, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't see it quite well, but it fractured when we placed it in a, in a different level. The, the screw fractured, so we couldn't even drive it in. So these are some of the complications that you can think of quad zygomas. We couldn't drive it in, it fractured in a bad position, but still we had three stable implants. So we went ahead, covered it up uh, with the plastic team, uh, came in, uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, came in and covered it up with a flap, uh, a radial forearm flap, and we perforated this and provided dentures to the patient. So the patient wakes up with dentures. And this is immediate on, on table. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, the, that's the teeth at the, at the table where we have loaded the teeth onto the implants. Uh, so the patient wakes up, woke up with the maxillary dentition. And on the right hand side, this is how she looked when she left the hospital about 10 days later. So, uh, even for the maxilla, trying to give occlusal outcomes or prosthetic outcomes have, have taken a very important role because that's how important it is for the patient. Uh, so there are newer techniques like zygoma, zip flaps and so on, which we perhaps will see more in the future. So the take home points from this is that uh, functional and occlusion based reconstruction is an important additional end goal of treatment. Of course, it's not the main goal. The main goal is still disease control, getting form back, but this is an additional goal. Implants improve functional jaw reconstruction outcomes. Planning of implants can be done using analog as well as digital methods. Uh, primary placement of zygomatic implants accelerates rehabilitation in patients undergoing maxillectomy. Uh, of course, the, I just do the reconstruction, planning, implants, teeth, and all of that, and a little bit of flaps. Uh, I have been really fortunate to work with very good research groups and very good clinicians around. Uh, all of this wouldn't have been possible without the ITI's research grant that they gave to us in 2011, which really you know, changed the whole outlook of, this, uh, of the treatment in our, in our country, if I may say so. Great group in NH Bangalore, Dr. Moni, Dr. Vikram, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Vijay, Sri Shankara, Dr. Narayana, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Prashant, Dr. Sainath, Dr. Sriram, prosthodontists, of course, Dr. Jacob, who I've been working with very closely for a long time, Dr. Gaurav, another brilliant prosthodontist, Dr. Mirli and Dr. Sainath, uh, Perio, Dr. Supriya, and in Minds team for giving me all the beginning of this training, uh, Felix, Peter, Kevan, Professor Wagner, and Professor Alnuas. Thank you all, and thank you for your very patient listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinay. My only thought is we need more Vinay's. <laughs> we need more of you so that more and more patients can get these kind of outcomes which you have showed. Amazing work. Thank you so much for gracing this uh, forum with your presence. And I'm sure we have a lot of questions in the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Dr. Anjan. Welcome, Dr. Anjan. You'll have to stop sharing, Dr. Vinay. Yes, how do I stop sharing? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this. I just try to... Uh, oh. Stop sharing? Just, yeah. Yeah. I think you have, yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming and attending this on a Saturday evening. And thank you, Taranjit, for having organized this brilliant uh, session. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Right. Okay. So, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fine. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. And, um, the topic is, you know, evolution of reconstruction, and I'm going to talk mostly about the maxilla. Um, I'm a maxillofacial surgeon uh, trained partly in India, in Bangalore, uh, Mumbai, and in the UK, and have been practicing in Bangalore doing microvascular uh, reconstruction and implants for the last uh, 12 years now in Bangalore. Um, and, um, you know, uh, when we talk about evolution, um, you know, it, it takes me back to, you know, this patient really, 
Uh, I did my initial head and neck training in Kidwai in 1997. And it was very common to see patients like this who had had re resections done and had uh, no re reconstruction. It was just primary closure. And uh, like Vinay has mentioned, you know, it was, you know, about survival and treating the disease, but not the patient. Uh, and she actually came back five years later saying, you know, look, I'm not happy with this. And uh, really, you know, uh, is there anything we can do about this? Because I can't go out. I need to cover my face with a sari all the time. Um, so even for uh, a patient who's not so, you know, socially and uh, uh, economically well off, uh, you know, uh, fun quality of life is important. And that's something I think we have to remember. And, uh, you know, just looking at quality of life, uh, just a few things. I mean, most of you may have heard of this, the University of Washington quality of life, which is probably the commonest or the most popular quality of life uh, questionnaire measure that we use. And uh, when patients come to us with cancers or tumors, you know, the first thing they ask is how many scars am I going to have and how many stitches am I going to have? But actually when you look at, you know, when they survive and when they get through their tumor tree treatment, um, um, uh, if you look at this chart over here, appearance is somewhere down fifth. Uh, and the things like lack of saliva, lack of being able to swallow, lack of being able to speak and chewing become far more important so this is how important the uh, chewing and speech and swallowing is. So if anyone tells you that, oh, you know, just treating the cancer is important, no. I think, uh, you know, for patients, uh, these functions are very, very important. Um, so I think the decisions that we have to make when we are treating these patients is, uh, do we use, uh, how are we going to rehabilitate these patients? Uh, do we use a flap or do we use an obturator? Uh, is there place to put implants in the residual maxilla or in the new mac, or do we need to put in a bony flap where we put in implants into the uh, fibula or into the DCIA? And uh, this will depend on a number of factors. Uh, the extent of the disease, what is the prognosis of the disease? If the prognosis of the disease is questionable, if we don't know whether the patient will survive through the cancer and its treatment, should we put in a lot of this effort? And that's something which we can discuss during the panel discussion. Uh, the patient's general health, is the patient fit for a free flap? Because not all patients may be fit for a free flap, for example. Uh, cost is an issue in our country, as we know, for a lot of our patients, uh, you know, a lot of this boils down finally to cost and whether they can afford the treatment. And finally, a lot of our patients come from long distances where uh, they need maintenance. And remember, all of this that we put in, whether it's the flap or the implants and the screws and the prosthetics, all needs maintenance. These patients need to come back and have it you know, maintained and parts replaced. And can the patient do that? These are some of the factors that we have to consider when we decide what sort of rehabilitation to do for a patient. And if we look at uh, the literature, again, there is really no difference in the outcome in terms of quality of life for an obturator versus a reconstruction, the free flap. Obviously, the, an obturator, the patient is more aware of something artificial there. But other than that, I think functionally, they both seem to do pretty well. The problem comes when the defect is higher up. So when the orbital rim and the zygoma is involved, uh, then I think appearance becomes an issue. You, know, you really can't support the tissue so well with an obturator. And uh, just, to, just to show an example, this is a really well rehabilitated case done by my friend and colleague, PC Jacob. Um, you can see this is a, a, a denture which has been converted into an obturator for this lady who's edentulous and had a maxillectomy. And uh, you know, functionally, she is fantastic. I mean, she has no swallowing and speech problems. Uh, she's got occlusion there, but uh, an obturator cannot rehabilitate the upper part of this defect. So the sunken eye and the sunken facial appearance is something which really an obturator can't uh, address. So um, this is just another example of a far more extensive defect. Uh, this is a, a mucopidormite carcinoma involving more than two thirds of the maxilla going up to the orbital floor, uh, almost going up to the cribiform plate. And uh, we've put in uh, basically a, a, a rectus flap with an orbital mesh to support the eye. Uh, so a big flap, 
so as to separate the oral cavity from the rest of it. And this is about a month later. And you can see in terms of facial form, uh, he has performed much better because the flap can support the tissues. The orbital mesh has reconstructed the orbit. So, you know, in terms of facial appearance and uh, swallowing because the flap has separated the oral cavity, he's doing well. Obviously, he doesn't have teeth, and that's something which we would have to address later on for him. Um, so there are basically two classifications which we use when we decide on how we are going to rehabilitate patients. So one is the, uh, as most maxillofacial surgeons will know, the Liverpool classification, which is the higher the defect, uh, the more complicated it tends to be. And therefore, for a low-level defect, you can use either an obturator, you can even use a local flap, or you can use a free flap, and I think they all work. But as the defect goes higher up, so when the orbital floor is involved, then facial form becomes a problem. And when higher up, when it's coming up to the base of skull, then really separating the tissues from the, from the oral tissues from the orbit so that and, and the base of skull, so the infections are not a problem in the long term, become more relevant. And therefore, a flap is indicated in these patients. Um, the classification that many uh, maxillofacial surgeons may not be aware of but which is a uh, much more popular in, amongst the prosthodontists is the OKs classification. And I think this really classifies uh, what sort of defects can be treated with an obturator versus a flap much better. So here we can see a, an OKs class one where less than 50% of this uh, uh, maxilla has been removed. And these are anterior and segmental defects. So, so these are OK class two. So OK class one and class two defects uh, can be treated with an obturator. As the defect gets bigger and more teeth are involved, more, more of the dentate segment is involved, then it becomes difficult to support uh, an obturator. And therefore, the algorithm suggests that in class 3 OK defects, uh, we should probably look more at vascularized free flaps rather than an obturator as a means of rehabilitation. Now, I think one thing which has changed, and OKS classification is a, a quite an old classification, is this was probably made when zygomatic implants were not so popular. And I think uh, having the option of quad zygomas has really uh, revolutionized being able to give patients obturators without free flaps. And I'll show you a few examples of this. Um, so this is just a conventional case, uh, one of uh, PC Jacobs again. Um, and this is actually a mucor case. I, I know a lot of people uh, I, who are attending have got uh, involved with the recent, you know, mucor uh, cases that we've had in the last year with the Delta variant. And um, this, but this is a 12-year-old case. So mucor has been there for a long time, and he had a maxillary re re uh, resection, uh, and uh, he's been uh, wearing an obturator, very elegantly re rehabilitated by. Dr. P.C. Jacob, you can see this very nice cast partial uh, framework uh, retained uh, obturator, which has lasted for a good 12 years. Um, and uh, you can see the facial form, the you know swallowing, the speech, the aesthetics. I haven't got a video of this, but you know it, all of this is excellent. Um, obviously, over a period of time, you know the teeth have deteriorated, and in fact, just very recently, we have started to replace some of these teeth with implants. And uh, so now he will eventually get uh, an, a conventional implant uh, retained obturator uh, as opposed to a complete dental uh, obturator. But this is, you know, a, a simple and straightforward way of rehabilitating these patients when they're okay as class one and class two. Um, you can also rehabilitate these patients with a flap. Um, so here is a lady who comes from about 200 kilometers from Bangalore. Uh, with a squamous cell carcinoma of the posterior maxilla. And uh, the resection over here would be an OKS class two. It's a posterior maxillary defect. And we could give the patient an obturator, but her problem is going to be oronasal communication and a leak. And uh, we decided to put in a temporalis flap because it was very difficult for her to come back repeatedly for having an obturator fabricated. She didn't have the facilities locally in the area where she came from to get an obturator made. And therefore, we decided to put in a flap. And she has enough teeth to function with. And the uh, flap that we've placed has closed the oronasal defect. And therefore, her speech and swallowing problems are addressed with the flap. So even in a sim more simpler classification, 
uh, a flap can be sometimes used for other reasons. Now, when it comes to microvascular reconstruction, how would we uh, plan these nowadays? So here is a total maxillectomy, again, a mucor patient. So we always reverse plan. So this is a wax trial uh, prepared by my colleague, Dr. PC Jacob. We put GP markers into this, and we use this as a guide to plan out our fibula. So we then have our team you know, virtually planning how much of fibula is to be removed. And we can then plan you know, how much of fibula can be placed. Uh, and that gives us an idea vertically and anterior posterly where the fibula is to be positioned so that we can finally get both the appearance of the, uh, the face as well as the positions of the implants, which will eventually be placed correct. Uh, particularly for the maxilla, uh, this is really useful because often pedicle length is a challenge to get a free flap up to the maxilla. Remember, they have to get in all the way from the neck and you can really plan how much of pedicle length you're going to have left with as well. So it, you know, uh, simplifies the whole process and it hopefully makes it more reliable as well. So this is an example of a patient who's had a free flap and you can see this is still fairly early. Uh, there's a bulky skin flap, which will eventually need to be thinned down. So there is a lot of soft tissue work to be done, but uh, you can see the primary result of this with a fibula in the maxilla. Here is another patient, you know, previously rehabilitated. This is with a DCIA. And even with these patients, I mean, soft tissue still is the major challenge. And you can see, although we've managed to place implants, there is no sulcus there. Where are we going to position the teeth? So these patients often require uh, soft tissue work, uh, similar to the DGR technique, which I don't think the Vinay has had a chance to talk about, but maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. We've uh, basically uh, created a sulcoplasty and used the denture to guide and create a sulcus. And we've finally been able to give the patient teeth. So these are some ways in which we can give these patients teeth using microvascular flaps. The third option is to use zygomatic implants so again, uh, the, the advantages of this are uh, the surgery is quicker than a free flap. Um, a microscopic free flap in my hands would take uh, would be a nine or ten hour operation. Uh, putting in four zygomas would take a maximum of two hours, so it's a much quicker operation on a patient who may not be fit for uh, a, a long procedure. Uh, you're placing the implants in stable bone. Now, sometimes having sufficient bone can be a challenge. Uh, but if there is enough bone, then yes, zygomas are a good option. And the advantage is that you get a much more stable prosthesis when there are not enough teeth for re, uh, uh, holding an obturator in place. So here is a patient who's got a lot of the maxilla missing. This is the uh, virtual planning. And again, all of these patients are virtually planned first. So we know exactly where the implants are going to go. Remember, it is technically quite challenging to put in four zygomatic implants, as you saw from the case that Vinay showed, it's not often that you can get the implants in the right position. So planning is very, very important. Uh, I think some echo somewhere on this. Uh, so I don't know whether it's someone's mic, which is switched on. Um, but here is an example of a patient. Again, this is a mucor defect, which uh, we've placed four zygomatic implants into. And um, here is uh, the, uh, a, fire, a, a, a bar attached to the zygomatic implants and the final prosthesis, a bar retained obturator. And when a patient has a palatal defect, we always give the patient a removable prosthesis because uh, the, the patient is, would not be able to clean this defect unless they take the prosthesis out for, for, for cleaning purposes. Uh, we have placed patient uh, implants in post radiotherapy patients as well, and they seem to perform quite well, probably because the zygoma is not always completely in the field of radiation. So it doesn't get the full blast of radiation, and that's probably why the vascularity is preserved. And here is an example of another patient post radiotherapy. We've rehabbed him, and you can see the uh, facial fullness that you can get because. With a regular obturator, it's very difficult to support the tissues, uh, but with a fixed uh, prosthesis on implants, you can push the tissues out, you can give the patient full uh, fullness of the face and appearance. So both in terms of appearance, speech and swallowing, the patient can be rehabilitated quite well. Uh, for a unilateral defect, you can use these on one side as well. Here is a patient who has been rehabbed with 
uh, unilateral uh, two zygomatic implants and a prosthesis which has been immediately placed as well. I think Vinay has also shown a similar case. Um, quad zygoma, and just to show you the quality of uh, life improvement that these patients get from uh, having uh, you know, a quad zygoma and an obturator. So this is a patient who, um, uh, one moment, um, I hope the audio is loud enough, but uh, this is the patient, um, one minute. So that is him speaking without his obturator in place. Waiting for print form. Vishnu Dutta Sarma, President of the BJS, BJP's Madhya Pradesh Unit, recently rejected the party state executive committee. It is only one supporter of Jyoti Javadichas India in the new 35 members. So we can see, uh, you know, how the speech Waiting. has improved by uh, using uh, zygomatic implants and giving a well-fitting obturator. Uh, the other option, as Vinay has also showed, is the uh, zygomatic implant perforated flap. So although uh, zygomas on their own will support a prosthesis, often maintenance is really difficult and the patients have difficulty cleaning around the implants. And the advantage I think of a zip flap is that the soft tissue, the oronasal seal is created by the flap and therefore the speech and swallowing problems are less and the maintenance issues are less. Um, um, I haven't done one using a radial forearm flap, but uh, we've done a few using a temporalis flap. So uh, what we usually done is place the zygomatic implants and then use the temporalis flap to cover the defect. And uh, that works quite well as well. Um, now, what do you do when a patient doesn't have a, a zygoma? Uh, what are the options for treating these patients? So if this lady is again a mucor survivor. Uh, we had to take out this lady's eye and you know, pretty much all of the mid-face bone on that side, including the zygoma, has to be, had to be removed. So, the, so zygomatic implants is not an option for her. So uh, initially we closed the defect using a temporized flap, which take care of most of her swallowing and oronasal leak problems. But uh, she wanted teeth for you know, speech and uh, chewing uh, function. And that is her bony defect. There really isn't any bone on that side. And uh, doing a unilateral uh, uh, two zygomatic implants for a whole prosthesis was something that you know, I wasn't really very comfortable with. Um, so we decided to uh, try something innovative uh, and we tried you know, uh, giving this lady a patient specific implant. Uh, again, this is probably the first PSI that I have done. So just uh, the planning part, uh, just to show you, um, planning of these patients is very, very important. You cannot leave this to the planning team or the, uh, uh, the 3D printing team. Uh, you need to sit with them, have a discussion. Uh, so when we scan this patient, we scan them with markers in place so that we know where the teeth are going to be. Uh, we know how much of prosthetic space the patient requires. So these are the radiographic markers which tell us where the teeth are going to be. Uh, we then tell the design team, okay, this is where the teeth are going to be. This is the amount of space we need for the prosthesis. And I want my abutments on the PSI to be somewhere over here and then they can go ahead and do the designs. So you can see that is the occlusal plane and we've got them to mark a second line uh, above this, which is where the prosthesis is going to fit in. Um, yeah, that's where the prosthesis is going to fit in. And above that is where the uh, implant needs to be uh, designed so that we have everything in the right place. Um, that is the patient at surgery. Um, We've exposed that side of the maxilla, uh, the right side. We've uh, fitted the uh, implant in. And for her, we had to do a, a orbital incision as well. We didn't have the sufficient access from the oral side because we wanted a lot of screws to hold this implant in since it was only on one side. Um, but that's the healed uh, implant. And the patient uh, is, uh, you know, this is, is being rehabilitated right now with an implant retained uh, prosthesis. 
Um, so uh, just you know, uh, summarizing uh, about implant rehabilitation, not only for the maxilla, but generally for, for, for patients, uh, I think this is something Vinay has already mentioned, is that uh, you know, a lot, uh, uh, patients can have rehabilitation and implant rehabilitation works really well. It does provide good quality of life and aesthetics, but there are problems that patients have, which we are still not able to solve and these continue to be challenges, and these are lack of saliva, taste and sensation, and immobility of the tongue. So if you have a patient, you know, comes to you and says, oh, I want to look, to be completely normal, you know, you have to, you know, tell them realistically what you can achieve, because uh, patients come with very high expectations, but unfortunately, we are not able to meet all their expectations. That's the reality, and we have to, you know, be honest and realistic with our patients. Um, also, uh, not all of these patients who have implants placed uh, will necessarily be able to complete their rehabilitation. Um, patients develop recurrences, they have failures of flaps, uh, they end up with problems after their chemotherapy, and some patients are just tired after their treatment and just don't want to have rehabilitation as well. So these are various things that we have to consider when we are rehabilitating these patients. And finally, complications. Remember that none of these procedures that we've talked about are without complications. Yes, we've shown you some nice cases, but behind this, you know, there are failures as well. Uh, those of you who do microvascular surgery know that there is at least a 5% risk of failure of uh, microvascular procedure. Uh, here is just an example of a fibula which has failed. Where the implants that we place, particularly in radiotherapy patients, uh, the risk of implants failing is there. Again, this patient had a fibula, he had radiation, he had a nice prosthesis for four years, but the implants all failed and all fell out. And this is something which can happen. And finally, the prosthetic failures, and I think Dr. Jacob will elaborate a little bit more, but remember that all of these are mechanical uh, uh, connections and they can break, they can fail. And this is something that the patient needs to be aware of. It's not something that you can fit and forget. Um, so just, you know, some of the take home messages from, you know, what I've talked about, you know, we've talked about how quality of life is important, uh, how reconstruction and rehabilitation is very important to consider in these patients. And I think 3D planning is definitely the way to go. It's evolving, it's improving every day, and it has made our life much better, much simpler and the patient's final result much better. Uh, but we have to consider patient factors. And remember that although we want to achieve the ideal, sometimes the patient's biology doesn't work for us. And that's something that we have to uh, inform patients about. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjan. Dr. Anjan and myself, we go a long way, more than 10 years now. And I, I think you're not audible. I'm not audible. Okay. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. My my side. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjan, for such a fantastic presentation. You and I we go long back, uh, ten years for me. And every time, whenever I have found myself into a tricky situation, you are my person to go to. And I'm 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 I can see now why that happens every time. I'm sure everybody else also appreciates that. Thank you so much. And I'm sure with your take home lessons, a lot of our attendees have got quite a bit of clarity on what to do when, and uh, obviously the complications are something that we all have to keep in mind before we plan things. Thank you. And let's go to our next presenter, Dr. P.C. Jacob, the most awaited man of the <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Jacob. Please start. Okay, can you see my presentation? Your presentation is uh, visible. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, okay, great. So thank you, Dr. Taranjit, for um, you know involving me uh, in this presentation. And uh, you know, I, I I've been really fortunate, um, uh, you know, to have worked with some brilliant uh, oral and maxillofacial surgeons. And I can truly say that they are, a lot of them are my very good friends. 
of course, um, Vinay and Anjan, you know. But the person who actually inspired me was Dr. Moni Kuryakos. And he is the person who took me under his wing. And, you know, um, uh, so he brought me up literally. So thanks to Moni. And of course, the first surgeon who actually um, uh, allowed me to work with him was Dr. Ashok Shanai, who was the head uh, of Kidwai. And um, yeah, you know, he 20, more than 20 years ago, he, he took me under his wing and he, uh, we started doing obturators together there. Of course, uh, thank you very much for, you know, uh, for the oral surgeons to wish us for uh, prosthodontist day. The only change is it is, it is happy prosthodontics. It's not prosthodontics, it's prosthodontist day. But anyway, thank you very much for that. Okay, so Dr. Vinay and Dr. Anjan have actually made my life easy. So I can, uh, you know, go quite fast through my presentation. Okay, there will be some repetitions of some slide, but I will just uh, go through them quickly. I tried to delete whatever I could, but there are a couple of repetitions here. So, we all know what the problems are after, you know, a mandibulectomy is done, you know. Uh, the way of treating them is either purely prosthetic or surgery with prosthodontics. And of course, implants play a huge role in, uh, um, you know, in rehabilitating these uh, ma mandibulectomy patients. And when you, when you have bone containing free flaps, you also have problems like soft tissue problems and bony problems. I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. And, uh, and finally, of course, the, the prosthetic options that we are going to use. So we all know what happens after a mandibulectomy, you know, if, if, if it is bilateral, then you end up with like an anti-gum deformity, or if it is unilateral, then you end up with mandibular deviation. And the functional issues we know, mastication, speech, mandibular deviation, definitely you have much more deviation if you have uh, closed primarily or, uh, you know, if you have used a, a soft tissue flap. Um, I would advise all my surgical colleagues that whenever possible, especially in the mandible, please use bone containing free flaps. And also you have something known as frontal pain rotation. That is that when the patient bites on the unresected side, you can see that this kind of a gap develops when you don't have uh, uh, when you don't have bony continuity. So, what is the what what were we doing before fibula? You know, I can't even imagine, you know, how it was earlier to that because, like I said, I I work with amazing surgeons who give me good uh, bone containing free flaps, so that ma makes my life much easier. But I know not all centers have this facility. Um, we use processes like these, uh, you know, uh, mandibular guidance processes. Basically, what it is, is here, actually, we had mandibulectomy and um, uh, partial maxillectomy of one side. So we went ahead and fabricated uh, processes like this. This closed the maxillary defect. And here you had a uh, palatal projection, which helped us to get the patient into occlusion. So what we do is we make a ramp. So when, when the patient closes, the first contact is on the ramp and the patient slides into position and comes into occlusion. Of course, it doesn't happen uh, this easily. Sometimes the patient has actually got to be taught how to do this. We need to probably move, uh, ask him to move the mandible, the unrestricted side, and then come into position. And slowly over a period of time, the pa patient is able to do this. Unfortunately, I've been spoiled and for the past five years, I have five, at least five years, I have not done a mandibular guidance therapy. So I'm actually probably forgetting uh, some of my maxillofacial prosthetics. The problem with these uh, palatal ramps, of course, is, is of course, it's quite uncomfortable for the patient, especially when they want to masticate and when they chew, some of them complain about that. So that's a big problem with, um, uh, with these uh, guidance therapies. Of course, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, okay? So these are the surgical options. Wherever possible, we would like a vascularized free flap, okay? And fibula is probably the most uh, uh, common one that my surgeons use. I know there are uh, you know, you have the um, you have others like scapula and others, um, which most of them my surgeons don't use. 
The big problem is, is this, the soft tissue problem. Now, if you see, this is a, a beautiful uh, sl um, slide that Dr. Vinay has made. And you can see here that he compares this to a, to a spring mattress. So you have, especially in single barrel cases, you have skin, then you have subcutaneous fat, and then you have the muscle, et cetera, over there, and then the bone. So having this much of soft tissue above actually makes it almost impossible to make a, a decent processes for the patient. So uh, I will explain a, a, a technique that Dr. Vinay and myself uh, developed and have followed and have published. Vinay has published it uh, quite extensively. And this is one of our first patients in whom we uh, went about uh, doing this technique. This was an ameloblastoma case, as you can see on the right side. This is uh, you know, immediately um, a week or so after the free flap was done, a week or two weeks after the free flap was done. This, is, this was our first attempt at doing a double barrel here. And you know, the, the, the upper segment was um, malaligned. And this patient needed to travel. He was a software engineer. So I think three months uh, uh, down the road, we, we went back in. Um, we tried to correct uh, this. And Dr. Pramod was there at that time. I, I, I almost forgot. Dr. Pramod was in Iran at that time. So we put in, uh, so they asked me, what can be done? You know, what can we do to load uh, and give him something that he can use? So we, I said, okay, let's try these uh, mini implants. So we went ahead and placed mini implants there and we gave him a denture. So this is him pre-op. This is about uh, a month after surgery. And this is about three to four, four months after that. So he went with this. Uh, he went away for about six months and came back. Then we went in and um, for the soft tissue problem, we had developed this technique known as DGER, which is denture guided epithelial regeneration. So basically what we do is, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not a surgeon. I'm, I'm just gonna try and explain it the best I can. So you have the fibula here, you have subcutaneous fat and you have the skin paddle on top. So what, what uh, the surgeons do is they make incisions, one on the buccal, one on the lingual. And then they wrap it over each other. So this is one and this is the other. And we would have fabricated a denture and kept it. And if the implants are not placed, we will place the implants. And uh, we were using Stroman. Uh, Vinay has said that uh, you know, we got a grant from Stroman. So we were using those implants. And we loaded these implants immediately. So that is uh, this technique actually the superior surface and a part of the uh, part of the uh, fibula on either side was bare it was bare bone and you can see here you can see the bare fibula over here and this is the denture that we have placed immediately this is about uh, one month um, uh, post um, you can see the the, the, uh, the tissue starting to heal at that time, I had made another temporary denture for the patient and then we connected it on. So uh, we connected that on and you can see how the healing is progressing. This, this was about uh, three months after surgery. The denture in position, the patient has got good occlusion. Um, this is with the implants in position. This is uh, about four or five months uh, after surgery. And you can see how beautifully the tissue has um, healed around. And Dr. Vinay again has taken samples of this. And it is keratinized tissue that we have got around these implants. And this is the final processes that the patient uh, had. We started this case in 2013 and finished it um, probably around the end of 2013 or the beginning of 2014. This is a follow-up that was taken in 2021. And you can see that the, the tissue is still as good as it is. The main advantage of this is the patient can remove the denture and he can clean around and maintain this. And of course, a periodontist also needs to evaluate this area um, you know, um, uh, frequently. So you can see the final process, very simple cast partial framework. And you can see the occlusion is still fantastic. And this is this you can see all the implants there. There's hardly any bone loss on any of them. So this is the advantage of this particular technique uh, that we have developed. Again, you can have issues with heart tissues. 
you can see here this this you know the form looks fantastic unfortunately when you take an uh, uh, you know a, a, C, a, a ct you can see that the the it's very difficult to rehabilitate this patient because the fibula is way too buccal and way too labial um, for us but somehow we were able to rehabilitate this patient so that is why planning is extremely important because unless the fibula is in the right position it is very very difficult to rehabilitate this patient this is an, uh, another patient of ours, um, and you can see here the amount of space that we have to cover. And if you try to do this with the fixed processes, the kind of cantilevering forces that you will have will be, uh, will be tremendous. So definitely uh, uh, an implant uh, retained removal processes is definitely the way to go for these patients, especially if it is going to be similar uh, a case like this. Of course, the, um, one of the solutions to that was uh, getting a double barrel done. But again, when we are doing a double barrel, what we found sometimes was that um, the, the full barrel was too high and we were having problems with um, you know, the implants. Uh, after the ball attachment or the whatever attachments we use, we were not having enough space for them. So one of the options is to do a one and a half barrel, cut the, uh, the upper barrel in half. So that is one. Or the second option is to go in and actually place your uh, single barrel, not on the uh, lower border, but somewhere in the middle. So that makes a lot of difference. Um, and it really doesn't make too much difference in the aesthetics of the patient. There is some difference, yes, but it makes a lot of difference um, in the final outcome of the processes. This is the only one case where I have done a fixed processes for a, a case situation like this. This was a patient who came down from Africa. At that time, of course, uh, we were not doing the DGR technique. Um, and you can see here, uh, there is a lot of soft tissue over here and a single barrel. So you can see again, the amount of space that we have to cover for, with the restoration. So we went ahead, um, you know, uh, made impressions and made a, a temporary processes for the patient. The patient went back, came back up after about three, four months. Um, and then we went ahead and made a final porcelain fused to metal Marlowe type processes. And this is the whole, the, the, all the steps that we went through. We ultimately had to cut the uh, processes in half because we just didn't have the parallelism. The main problem with a situation like this is, of course, maintenance. Cleaning is going to be definitely going to be an issue. We have tried to keep space underneath, but uh, the unfortunate part is we lost him to follow up because he's from Africa. We were not able to follow him up, unfortunately. But I would definitely not recommend doing a processes like this for, a, uh, for one of our reconstructed patients. Uh, this is an excellent article, again, authored by Vinay, uh, and, you know, it gives a lot of information about the implant retained uh, processes. So I would recommend um, anybody interested in that to go through this. And the take home message uh, in mandibles is that planning is absolutely essential, not only in the mandible, but also in the maxilla. Okay. And also, uh, I have put maxillofacial here, but a prosthodontist has definitely got to be involved. Uh, the unfortunate part is we do not have training in maxillofacial prosthetics in India. And um, we are trying to uh, correct that problem. Dr. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Sa um, what's his name? Uh, Shankar Iyer and myself and Dr. Varun Acharya are uh, uh, in the process of coming together and starting a program, a, a fellowship actually. Unfortunately, COVID keeps coming in the middle. We were supposed to start it in 20, then 21. Now, hopefully, we will start it sometime in the middle of 22. Uh, of course, implants help uh, in, uh, you know, to improve the quality of life. And of course, we know the difficulties, uh, management of peri-implant tissue, uh, inadequate bony, bony alignment. And of course, it does take time to finish these treatments. And there are different methods uh, that, that are there to improve the peri-implant soft tissue. Now, coming quickly to the maxilla, because we know the problems with maxillectomy, you know, speed, swallowing, psychological issues, everything. 
and of course there are huge prosthodontic challenges also depending on the number of teeth that are there how good those teeth are you know we need to restore the palatal contours we need to replace the dentition all of those things need to take place but in okay's class 1 and class 2 this is a fabulous way of of rehabilitating the patient in edentulous cases it becomes much tougher um you know like you saw the uh, patient that uh, dr anjan had shown if we can go in and put a couple of implants inside then of course it makes uh, life uh, much simpler but the uh, the kind of loading that those implants are subjected to is also a cause for concern so uh, in terms of rehabilitation either you can do just obturators or you can do surgery and obturation like we did here of course we know the uh, uh, you know the what are the advantages what we don't want is is flaps like this you know soft tissue flaps um there is nothing i can offer this patient nothing i will have to send it back to the surgeon either to debulk it significantly or i should be able to put in um an adequate number of implants inside even then it's going to be very difficult to get good uh, uh, contours for the patient but a flap like this is fantastic we have bone containing free flap you have implants you can give the patient a fabulous outcome now quickly um, how surgeons can help to improve prosthetic prognosis you know i i i get irritated with a lot of my prosthodontic colleagues when they say uh, that they tell their surgeon to send it after they have done the surgery that's not the way to do it you need to be in the ot you need to help the surgeons you know to make some corrections minor corrections that will help us to make better um processes you need to do transverse alveolar resections don't go in between interdental areas of course the oral maxillofacials won't do that but other other surgeons do that we need to retain as much of the hard palate as possible the more the hard palate the better you need to place skin grafts extremely vital especially on the cheek flap and wherever else uh, that is possible also maintain as much of the palatal mucosa which is not involved and line the cut margin with that then preservation of soft palate um you know uh, if it is a dentulous case we don't need to retain anything of course when zygomatic implants are uh, are required uh, are uh, possible then also we don't need to retain but if it is a case where none of this is possible then the soft palate the cut soft palate can be used like a sling so only in that situation we need to uh, preserve the soft palate then access to the defect uh, please don't leave turbinates that becomes very difficult for us to rehabilitate patients with turbinates they bleed they hurt the patient when the process touches them and of course osseo integrated implants have been a boon to us so i'll just quickly go through this is if you do a transalveolar um, you know cut maintain the hard palate cheek uh, line the cheek flap uh we want a good uh, undercut like this which will help us to position get some retention for the processes in this case there is no need to leave this here if zygomatic implants are not possible then we can use this as a sling access to the defect very difficult to rehabilitate this patient these turbinates need to be removed otherwise it is impossible to rehabilitate this patient and of course implants have made have been a boon you know as the zygomatic implants or regular implants this dr anjan has spoken so i won't go into that i quickly uh, just discuss what are the types of obturators you have immediate intermediate and definite immediate is given uh, is actually made before the surgery and connected at the time of surgery either pack the defect with uh, bismuth iodoform gauze or some such and then place the um processes in position wire it in position um this is how it is delivered this is with bismuth iodoform gauze intermediate either the surgical can be converted or um you know with something like this like rebase which is polyethyl methacrylate or you can make an impression and make a completely new intermediate uh, uh, processes with some teeth on it trismus is of course a big problem for us uh, you know i have found that uh, you know this process is the uh, heisters 
is very, very effective. I, I find it much better than the terabyte. Um, you know, patient will just not put the amount of force that is required to open, but this can be done by another person. And I think it, it does a much better job. And it needs to be started early, as early as uh, about uh, two weeks post-surgery. Definitive process given four to six months after healing, okay? Um, depends on the, uh, whether radiation is given or not. I, I have skipped uh, regular processes because Dr. Anjan showed that. This is um, one of our free flap cases. I'm going to quickly go through that. Um, so this patient was operated somewhere else and um, she had recurrence. She had multifocal squamous cell carcinoma. Patient came to us, Dr. Moni operated. This is all just the surgical planning. We had, we placed a fibula for her. Um, we can play, we at Narayana, we now place implants primarily uh, in most of our cases. This is the, the guide that is used. Um, you can see the, um, you know, the implants in position. This, this is, I'm just showing how the, how we place the implants. So they can either be placed on the leg or sometimes we place it in the, in the mouth also. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the implants were placed for her primarily. Uh, we went back in um, after six months and we uncovered them. In situations like this, where there is no support at all, we, I normally give a plate first. Uh, you can see that um, you know these are the attachments we use. We use positioners or um, Nova Lock, which depends on the company. We make a plate like this, which is connected in the mouth. Patient came back after three, um, after one month, you can see how the tissue is healing. This is the intermediate processes that the patient received. And you can see what a huge difference it has made to her, uh, her confidence and she was able to eat uh, and speak and swallow normally. This is after complete healing. This area was, uh, had a slight uh, infection because of a plate. Once we removed that, it, it went away. And this is the, how the tissue looks finally. This case, uh, Dr. Anjan has already spoken about. We went in and actually gave a header bar for him. He used it for about six months and he broke the bar. So we had to go back in. We thought, okay, you know, uh, we went back in. Uh, we do the normal implant procedures and we take a final impression. Uh, we thought we'll make a thicker bar. So we made a thicker bar for him with, uh, with ball attachments on it. And he went and broke this in two months. So zygomatic, uh, quad zygoma cases are not easy. They are extremely challenging. They need to be planned properly. And even with good planning, you can have problems with them. So ultimately, uh, Dr. Um, Anjan went in and he has closed the defect with uh, with a temporal flaw. So yeah, I'm not going to go through all this. Dr. Anjan has already done this. So the, the final take home messages in the in the maxilla for class one and class two, we can rehabilitate it with obturators. With class three, it is best uh, with surgical reconstruction and implant assisted prosthodontics. And zygoma implants can assist rehabilitation of maxillectomy defects. I would like to again reiterate that I have been fortunate during my career to work with brilliant um, maxillofacial surgeons, um, you know, like uh, Dr. Moni, Dr. Vinay, Anjan, and, and, a, and a lot, lot more people. So I, I encourage all the surgeons and prosthodontists to work together to, to rehabilitate our patients in the best way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Taranjit. Hi, Dr. Uh, Aditya. Would you like yeah, to I, comment on uh, Dr. Jacob's presentation? My I'll goodness, comment on that all was presentations. amazing. Oh my God. Yes, Please I'll comment on all the presentations. I, I, I think we got uh, a very, very well-rounded um, 
a discussion about uh, occlusion occlusion based rehabilitation the concept the concept of um, um, reconstruction has extended to rehabilitation it may sound as semantics but the truth be told if a patient survives uh, for a year and a half he is asking when he can eat the next pani puri or chicken kebab and uh, why not uh, we, we have uh, ensured that the patient lives we we have to go ahead and ensure that he lives well and if if i were to ever uh, have my jaw removed by anjan uh, i sure as hell would want vinay and uh, dr jacob to put in teeth for me if i survive it so no not that anjan would kill me the disease might but anyway the um, the only thing now is before we go on to uh, one one request to all the um, uh, audience here if they can put up the queries on the in the chat box it will make life a lot easier for all of us uh, we can formulate our answers and uh, have a a very fruitful discussion but before that uh, i think um, there has been a small request that we discuss about patient specific implants i am i'm not an expert on this but uh, truth be told patient specific implants uh, are nobody's child uh, in most parts of the world pretty much anywhere in the world because there just isn't enough data to go on uh, though it's experimental there is no reason for us not to extrapolate on current um uh, proven techniques and uh, um attempt something well within the uh, realms of uh, scientific logic uh, i am going to take uh, uh, you through a few cases um where i have attempted to place um, uh, patient specific implants for mandibular reconstruction um uh, do, you, do you mind if i share the screen you need to unmute yourself uh, Yes, go ahead, Doctor. Yes, yeah. Can you all see my screen? No. It's visible. Your screen is visible. Visible, yeah. is it? Okay. Let me go to the first. Okay. Are Are you on the slide show here? Tarajit, can everybody yes. see? Yes. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, I, at the outset, I've had a chat with uh, most people, uh, all the panelists about this. At the outset, let me clarify that um, uh, these are right now in an experimental stage. Uh, we spend a huge amount of time sitting with uh, the engineers uh, and the software engineers and the um, fabricators of these implants. This is uh, not for. This is not a plug and play situation right now. we need to plan this plan this very carefully and choose our cases very carefully and most importantly there has to be an honest declaration to the patient that these are experimental and for the my first patient i told him up front that he is my first patient and i'm extending a philosophy so okay this was the gentleman um a lot of my photos uh, are uh, incomplete they're not ideal purely because uh, i did this in short time but um, i'll be happy to share it uh, share, share the rest of them with taranjit when i get them uh, she'll forward it to the rest of the participants this gentleman had had an amyloblastoma chopped off his face um just a year before his wedding he came to me because um, uh, there was a reconstruction plate sticking out of his neck that placed uh, a rather adventurous um, Uh, ilia crest because it was a near hemi mandibular defect uh, and uh, that had dissolved at this point what what we could do what, what you see is what you get here uh, there was the stump of mandible and a little bit of uh, his uh, condyle remi- remaining and uh, this is what uh, uh, we did i planned a guide for resection and uh, we planned this basically uh, we had them scan the fossa component of a temporomandibular joint stock joint uh, then we had them mirror the mandible and we sat together to ensure that uh, we got the right dimension for the condyla head and in this particular case i planned um a uh, scaffolding tray with silos technically what i had hoped was that i would fill these silos with uh, bone graft and prp and eventually i would open up and uh, place implants in them i don't place implants my colleagues would and i had i have i had I, at the outset decided that this is going to be a two stage procedure purely because i was not going to put this through the mouth when the mouth was open i removed all of it it was infected anyway waited for a few weeks and i went back and um 
this, this is the yeah, implant which is fabricated. Um, and I went back and uh, used the cutting guide to resect it. Uh, this, the surgery itself is not particularly challenging. Um, I made, made a tunnel from the periauricular region into the surgical defect, um, removed the condyle, flattened it out. And there goes the, um, on the right-hand side, you see the uh, poly co um, a component of the temporomandibular joint with uh, the neo-TMJ. And uh, on the left-hand side, you see the bone graft filled um, um, prosthetic mandible. And this is how he is. And once we were sure that this chap is very happy with his premolar occlusion on the right side and his jaw is not deviating, he just didn't, in, didn't even want to attempt uh, implants. And uh, quite honestly, I was um, um, pretty thankful because I had no idea what would happen if I opened the oral mucosa because there are some things sacrosanct here, oral mucosal seal, which is where I get terribly worried when I see a lot of people doing this orthognathic surgery when they have just replaced the temporomandibular joint. If you were to ever walk into a joint replacement in an orthopedic OT, you, you'll be breathing through your eyes because they're that scared of infection. So uh, right now, I do not think we should challenge nature. Uh, all the surgery of uh, such PSI should be transcervical. And uh, those things with implants sticking out of them, I don't see how they make uh, uh, for anything other than a disaster. Uh, OK, this is the next case. This is supposed to be case two. But anyway, on the left-hand side, this gentleman was a medication-related uh, osteonecrosis. He was on uh, steroids, methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, somebody popped in an implant and the bone around it started to dissolve. Um, we managed this conservatively till he had a pathological fracture. And once he had, we didn't have a choice, stopped the methotrexate a few weeks later, went back to reset the mandible. And uh, th this is an example of the same stereolithographic model following planning. The mandible was mirrored. Um, uh, I work with only one set of people, so they know what I need, especially because uh, this is something we, are, uh, we do not have anything to go on. Uh, if you will notice carefully, there is a cupping around the inferior part of the mandible, and uh, that almost goes, goes to the in, um, uh, lingual aspect of the inferior border. And uh, the screws used are in such a way that they don't interfere with each other, and they're bicortical in nature. Um, and uh, the uh, fossa component is fixed like you would fix for any routine TMJ uh, joint reconstruction. This is another example of this. And um, uh, in this case, you will also notice that I have slightly rounded the occlusal part of the PSI. Uh, here, I was already wondering whether I should even think of an implant. And by the time we took him up for surgery, I had decided that this gentleman probably we are not going to touch him. The quality of the oral mucosa was so fragile. If I opened it up, there's a very good chance I would lose the implant. And uh, there he is. Uh, I, I left him on uh, uh, guiding brackets for, uh, for a period of time till the healing was complete. Sorry, guiding elastics and uh, uh, he's retained a decent shape. Um, and uh, he, he got some sort of um, um, uh, removal partial denture, which was barely acceptable, but, but from his point of view, he did not want more and I wasn't offering him more. I, he continues to come for follow-up. He's 16 months uh, post-surgery and the, sorry, he's uh, 12 months post-surgery and the first chap is uh, um, uh, one year post-op. Now, uh, because of these successes, I stretched my luck a little bit. And we had a um, uh, failed fibula following um, um, cancer reconstruction uh, elsewhere. And this gentleman turned up to me, a big chap. Uh, they had um, put in a PMMC. I thought there was a lot of tissue. I was very happy and I sat and planned. If you look at it carefully, you will straight away notice that in hindsight, I can straight away notice several mistakes other than the case selection. One is the sheer width of the implant. Uh, the second one is the sharp edge of the implant towards the oral mucosa. And the third is the height of the implant. I placed that, there was a very, very small communication in the anterior region. I sutured it over and over the period of next two weeks, the whole implant was exposed. You can see that even for somebody who's operated, you have a look at this, you know that this tissue isn't healthy. But uh, I, I think I was a little bit drunk on the success of the first two cases, and I thoroughly regret touching this one. Uh, we placed it, the uh, X-ray looks good, but the X-ray also tells you uh, what the problem is. It's just too big an implant, 
we are not respecting the sanctity of uh, an already radiated oral mucosa and uh, we have tried to do too much here and uh, nature has just told us that we need to back off. So at this point, patient specific implants are experimental, but there are going to be conditions where a fibula is not acceptable. In all three cases, the fibula was offered, but uh, it was deemed unnecessary by um, the patient. No, it was deemed um, unacceptable by one patient. Uh, it, uh, I did not want to offer a fibula because the patient too had peripheral vascular disease. The uh, preoperative Doppler didn't show up, uh, uh, a very good runoff there. And the third patient had a fibula, didn't uh, failed fibula, hence did not want it. So if we select the cases well, there is a future. The idea is that patient-specific implants should follow what's already established. So if you're reconstructing one third of a lost mandible, it is an extension of a temporomandibular joint reconstruction. However, in benign cases, especially if you can augment with a fam flap or something to ensure oral mucosal sanctity, it might be something to look out for, but there is a lot of work to do. There's a lot of uh, data we need to collect and, and uh, look over shoulder all the time. And, uh, but all said and done, tissue engineering and um, uh, patient specific implants, I think are here to stay. It's a matter of time before we formulate protocols and get on with it. Thank you for this opportunity for the short presentation. Now I'll wear the other hat of a moderator and uh, we'll take it from there. All right now, so. Yes, Dr. Uh, Aditya, let's start. Do you have any questions? Because I don't see many questions here. Uh, do you see any? I think there's oh. one, Mr. So Vinay. I thought I saw a fair few. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll take that from Manish, I think. Uh, how is your results in implants with irradiated cases? Yep, that's the one, yes. Yeah, yeah, thanks Manish for the question. So, you know, we look at what is your results in implants in irradiated cases. And I'd like to look at the, uh, the results in three different levels. One at the patient level, about his quality of life, about his disease and so on. And irradiated patients have unfortunately worse quality of life as compared to patients who are not irradiated, irrespective of implant placement. So whether you place an implant or not, they tend to have poorer quality of lives. Now at the implant and the prosthesis level, those are the two other levels that I would like to look at my outcomes. At the implant level, very surprisingly, if the soft tissue management has been done right, and if we have done the DGER, the patient is under good perio maintenance, we have not had any difference in loss of implants as compared to our two groups. So we had about 22% of our implants in that 46 patients that we had recalled, 22% of them were irradiated patients. And there was no uh, increased implant related, peri-implant related or prosthetic related complications in these uh, patients. But of course they have other complications, they, like for example, disease recurrence that you will never see in a patient who's a benign patient. You know, We never have had any case who has come back with a, a disease recurrence, but we have had two or three patients where they came back with a recurrence. So when you look at the outcomes in these patients, if you look at all of these implant related outcomes are just as good as, any, uh, as benign patients, provided it's done in the right way. I hope that is, uh, that, that answers. Yes, um, th thanks Vinay. Uh, but uh, there's there's one thing I'll bring Anjan into this. Is, is Anjan around? Yeah, I think he's. Uh, I'll bring Anjan into this. There is a point that was made uh, regarding the double barreling of a fibula. I think Manish also has asked that question about the double barreling of the fibula uh, versus placing the fibula slightly higher up. My own experience nowadays, what I do, Anjan, is as a routine, the implant, uh, the fibula is placed uh, um, about 10 to 12 millimeters above the inferior border. And as a routine, we take the FHL uh, in a very thick cuff. Um, and I have noticed that uh, the um, inferior border looks as well controlled as we can ever expect with a fibula. Uh, do you do the same thing, Anjan? So yeah, for, for, for an anterior mandible, uh, if I have a patient who I'm doing a bone only flap and a lot of the ameloblastomas and keratocysts, mm. you know, where you have enough soft tissue cover for getting using mucosa, uh, I would do a bone only flap. And I think it's pretty reasonable doing a double barrel because you also provide support to the lip as well when you're doing a double barrel using the bone itself. 
but when you're doing a skin paddle, particularly, you know, it becomes a lot more challenging. One is because your skin paddle is very often on the segment where you're turning it over for the double barrel and you're worried about kinking the perforators on the skin paddle. Secondly, your skin paddle becomes so thick and high up that the patient keeps biting on the skin paddle. So if I'm doing a skin paddle, uh, you know, flap, even for the anti but I would generally try to keep the barrel higher up and then have a space underneath. So then you fill that up with either the FHL muscle or uh, the residual skin paddle that you have, uh, which you've turned over. That's my practice usually. So for if it's a skin and bone flap, then, you know, keep it higher up. If it's a bone only flap, double barrel for the anterior mandible. As far as the posterior mandible, no, just a single barrel is usually sufficient. Okay. Aditya, can I just come in for a minute? Please, please. The, the only thing is when you're doing a double barrel, you have to make sure that you have enough prosthetic space about that. Yeah. We, we have burnt our fingers with that. So yeah. like a, some sort of a splint needs to be there, which will tell you uh, how difficult Anjan is it to like make it one and a half barrel? Is that possible? Uh, no, it's possible. But uh, I mean, if you look at long term, some of the double barrels that we've done as well, you know, the, the, the double barrel, the upper bar part of it, because that's the distal most often resorbs. Mm, that's true. Um, so, you know, having a half of it, I don't know how much of it would survive. And, you know, because that's the part in which your implants are going to be in. Exactly. exactly. So I think that's the problem. So, so one of the things, again, that we do is if we are doing a double barrel, is I try to get implants to engage one of the cortices of the lower barrel as well. It means using longer implants yeah. because your fibula is a very cortical bone. It has very little cancellous bone. It's relying completely on the cortical plates. So, you right. know, using longer implants, engaging three cortices sometimes with, with a double barrel is, uh, you know, probably, you know, the way. In fact, uh, you know, I, I did some of the patients which, you know, uh, Vinay very gladly, uh, graciously gave us implants for from that Strauman study group. The only ones where we lost one or two implants were in the double barrel. The single mm -hmm. barrel, we never lost a single implant. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, taking the, uh, you know, taking the single barrel halfway up the mandible, is that a, is that a that's solution? probably a better option? Better option. Uh, but again, you know, see, the problem is uh, it, the, the mandible is much taller than the fibula in a lot of these patients. And uh, the lip support that you get from a double barrel, because, you know, because you've bulked up the bone, the lip is supported better. So that is lacking, you know, in these patients. Even after, I mean, the bulk, the, the process does help because you bulk out the process. And that's, again, one of the reasons for giving a removal process is because you yeah. need to give a flange to bulk the sulcus and provide support to the lip, which you can't do with a fixed process. Uh, but then, yeah, I think a single, if you're doing a single, single barrel, almost guaranteed you're going to use a removal process to bulk the lip out. Yeah. Again, I would like to reiterate, please do not give fixed processes yeah. to, uh, you know, reconstructed patients. Okay? And, and, and I, I can count on one hand, you know, the number of ones we have done fixed processes for. I don't think we've done many at all. Uh, no. Okay. I think I, we have two I would like to add yeah. one more thing about the double barrel. So when we yeah. check out of our patients comparing single barrel to double barrel, something is very important. Is the width of attached mucosa that you can get, the depth of the vestibule that you can get, the quality of the soft tissue that you can get around the, uh, the fibula is much better than a double barrel simply because it has got a higher, higher platform. So that's also another thing. It makes your DGR much easier, soft tissue management much easier. Uh, but of course, you have to make sure that there is adequate space for the prosthesis. Yeah, and I think one point is, I think, you know, the tissue level implants as well. I think these cases, I think the tissue level implants are probably much better than the bone level implants for these patients. I don't know what your experience is, Vinay. Yeah, absolutely. Tissue level implants with removable prosthesis is yeah. that concept which I completely believe in. We've got really long-term data regarding how well they perform. So... Uh, yeah, I think that's that's some concept that we had got into it, you know, till then it was all about giving fixed, but uh, clearly it's not the case. Yeah, you know, as dentists, we need to get it out of our mind that fixed is better than removable, you know. We have that preconceived notion that somehow fixed is better than removable. That is not true. If you have good attachments there, you've seen the case that Vinay showed. He could chew virtually anything he wanted. 
and that is not just one patient that is multiple patients correct vinay yeah and i would like to tell you my personal story so coming in from bangalore and doing the study and saying how good removable are i went into sweden to in, to get invited there for the re recon program and when i said no we give a removable denture they were like oh no we are in sweden you know so we have to give fixed we gave they gave a fixed denture to the patient and after 6 months they removed it and gave a removable denture and say okay fine maybe it is better to you know uh, to uh, maintain uh, with the removable in spite of you know the the, the government paying everything uh, for a fixed so i think functionally maintenance wise elderly patients all of that you take in in consideration it's better to give a removable yeah so i agree i think dr Laksh rashmi has a quick question but before that there's a follow on question regarding fibula from manish he is uh, a little concerned regarding uh, the stripping of the fibula for periosteum for vestibular plasty um uh, does anybody want to weigh in on this one i think probably vinay probably should probably yeah vinay should talk yeah. yeah so for the dgr when we developed the technique well it was first for benign patients but for radiation patients we do a supra periosteal dissection and we leave the periosteum intact and have the denture still guide belong with the periosteum we were just being uh, I, we have to be more careful in them nevertheless irrespective of if they were irradiated or not irradiated the tissues that form on top are keratinized mucosa we have done proteomic analysis with mass spec we have done uh, immunohistochemistry and of course histology and it clearly shows that the regenerated mucosa irrespective of whether we keep the, keep the periosteum or bare the periosteum the mucosa resembles keratinized oral mucosa more than any other tissue so it is a very valid procedure and now there are 7 to 8 year outcomes of uh, most of them and there is no problem with the procedure. more than that we need more than that yeah nearly 10 year yeah among right. them, so we compared the three different soft tissue management techniques with a palatal connective tissue or a palatal mucosal graft a split thickness skin graft and the third one with dgea when we compared all these three groups we found a uh, little bit uh, better uh, outcomes with dgea and it's just not now this group uh, but it has been performed in a group all over the world there is a report, report from australia there's a report from japan they have modified it of course with some other technique but this is basically the the, the philosophy that they follow i think the soft tissue part which dr rashmi has asked i think is uh, very well covered in the discussion um uh, if not you please do add something to it but i would like to set the cat among the pigeons here now um while we have to have uh, our um, degree of pride in our background in dentistry um Uh, I I I am I'm I'm not going to, going to assume that nobody understands the patient situation. We all do. Are we are we getting a bit carried away by um, looking at long term results for teeth when a lot of the diseases we see will not see see the next birthday? Are are do we do we have to be far more circumspect when we choose our cases? Should should we? I know our Dr. Moni is a very strict clinician. He does not. appreciate surgeons being swayed by economy by the emotion we have to be scientific clinicians i agree but in in practice uh, i am afraid i am not uh, uh, anywhere near somebody like dr moni and i am i am afraid uh, the patients economic uh, economic concerns the patients background all of this comes into play and is this a uh, tendency towards um, uh, put, popping in implants uh, willy nilly um a little adventurous uh, i would like um, vinay to go first i know he's very passionate and dr jacob uh, uh, no holds bar uh, no holds bar reply please yeah, okay thanks for this so i don't do onco i am not an onco surgeon and about the disease characteristics and the uh, and how the disease goes although i've been with the onco surgeons for a very really long time i some as a matter of principle i don't do ablative surgery i am a very poor candidate to make a choice of whether the patient will survive or will not survive or so on and so forth but nevertheless when asked to me whether the patient and i clearly believe it is the patient's wish should he have dental rehabilitation or not there's no point in trying to give them dental rehab if they don't understand it or they don't want. so it's not like you know the blanket give everybody a dental uh, a dental implants i'm completely against that 
but at the same time, if the patient wishes to do so, and if uh, uh, the treating physician, uh, the oncosurgeon says that, hey, we want to give this guy teeth, and it is referred to me, then I will take all that it takes to make sure that I do it well, execute it well, and place the implant in the correct position so that he can get teeth. But I don't go there and advertise and say, give me all the patients, whichever patient comes in, we have to place an implant. No, I, that's completely wrong. I completely, uh, I, I don't agree with that. Well put. Uh, Anjan, I'll have to bring you in last because uh, uh, we both are ablative surgeons, but I want Dr. Jacob to uh, mount a defense because I'm question. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, a devil's advocate here and I'm questioning whether uh, this habit of uh, uh, popping in implants in the leg, is it really necessary? Do we, uh, can't we just wait for that period of six months or a year it takes for things to settle down? Uh, okay, what would your point of view answer yourself? that question? Especially if the patient is getting irradiated, I would like to place, get the implants placed pre-radiation. That means I would like them placed at the time of ablation and reconstruction. Because anyway, we have to wait for six months after that. And I asked this question to Dr. Moni. I said, why are we waiting for six months? Give me a good reason. Because whatever uh, changes are going to happen, they're only going to get worse over a period of time. So earlier people said, you wait for one year. Now, what is the justification for that? There is no justification. So he told me the only reason why we wait for six months is because we want the immediate problems with the surgery and the radiation to be over. So if we have to go in and place implants at that time, we are again making the patients, we are, we are, first of all, we have to again open an incision and do all of that. If it is done in the primary surgery, okay, then at this stage, we can go ahead and start rehabilitating. <clears throat> so that is my reason for um, having the uh, implants placed primarily. I can answer that also once more. Sorry, just, oh, just sure, sure. for that. You can read a paper by Ike Scheignitz from University of Mines. Ike, Pear, Camera, Bilal Alnuas, Wilfried Wagner. They are there on that paper. They did a systematic review of implants placed in irradiation patients. And they find that it is better to have implants placed primarily in these cases for, or you have to wait for more than a year to place an implant, according to their uh, uh, systematic reviews. But what is the justification of one year, Vinay? Again, what is the justification? No, it's just that uh, you wait for the radiation to get over six months, basically. But after immediately with acute radiation damage, I don't think any patient is uh, would like to get in, uh, go in another surgery. It's another big surgery, right? So we say six months at least, but... Yeah, six months, yeah. Implant survival is done in this. Traditionally, it's been done in these two groups. And then if it's it's same survival rates. Yeah. I like that. Anjan, you and I are far more pragmatic people. So... And we have uh, the same uh, problems. I think, yeah, there is a good biological reason for placing implants uh, at the time of the primary surgery. Uh, because I think the osseointegration integration and the successes are probably better. But I think if you look at the literature, all the literature comes from Europe. And uh, in most of Europe, it is all managed healthcare where cost is not an issue. Uh, and for us, obviously, cost is a major issue. Sometimes even putting a free flap is a, is a cost issue for our patients. So I think our, our practice is to, uh, if it's a benign tumor, yes, we would consider placing implants primarily. But if it is for a malignancy, we would rather wait um, yes, you know, it's probably 50, 60,000 rupees maybe of implants, but you know, sometimes that's the difference between patient being able to pay for their chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So I think, uh, you know, that I, that, I think the major issue with patients uh, who have cancer and treatment for it is one, uh, you know, post radiotherapy mouth opening and access for, you know, doing any prosthetic work. So you might have placed my, the implants, but the access is no longer there to rehabilitate them. And especially if you've placed the implants, the patients expect to get a prosthesis. Uh, if you are then not able to give a prosthesis, which is reasonably, uh, you know, looking okay, then I think, you know, you have a very unhappy patient. So I think that's the reason why, I mean, from a pragmatic and a practice management point of view, 
Um, my, my practice is not to place the implants immediately, especially for the malignancy patients, but wait, like uh, 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 Vinay says, for a year. Uh, let the patient, uh, you know, uh, recover, ma make sure he's disease free, have a PET scan. And then if everything looks okay at that stage, we consider placing implants. I think the other thing is, uh, you know, that patients need to understand that not all of their problems can be solved by placing implants. You know, sometimes they feel that, oh, just by having teeth and implants, they will be back to normal. And, uh, you know, they have to realize that that's not going to happen. And uh, sometimes, you know, having the edentulous phase uh, probably brings down that expectation and brings them to reality as to what, uh, you know, we can actually achieve. Excellent. Thank you. I think Dr. Rashmi, Rashmi has one other question before we carry on with the discussion um, to all of you. When would you want to go ahead with um, a soft tissue procedure after radiation therapy? Because I'm assuming that the implant was not in in the first place. So we've just discussed those questions and I think it ranges between six months and a year. Um, uh, if, if I can uh, um, uh, probably summarize what was discussed, the issue is that you had surgery now and you're radiated four to six weeks later, radiation lasts for another four weeks, then you lost two and a half months. And uh, uh, believe you me, for the next three months, the patient doesn't want the mouth touched for whatever reason. And even if you want to, it can't. So six months is gone there. And I have a feeling the tradition of one year uh, was because of the older forms of radiation where there was so much of surrounding tissue damage that it would take a lot longer for tissues to recover. Uh, Anjan, correct me if I'm wrong. Currently, I think tissues recover rather rapidly with the uh, newer technology in radiation therapy. Yeah, for most patients, yes. Yes. So, right. I'll just check if... Yeah. Uh, I uh, have one question. I have one question for Dr. Jacob. Uh, sir, in case of uh, currently they are using all these scanners to uh, scan and make the impressions and then come up with uh, the prosthesis. Uh, one of our prosthetists has done that for one of my myocard defect patients. How accurate or good are, you know, how precise are these scanners? And, and, and you think that is the way to go forward? What is your thought on this? I personally don't have any experience with using scanners. Actually, I haven't used scanners for anything, uh, for impressions. Or, they're just too expensive, you know. Yes. Yes. They definitely increase the cost, yeah. yeah. Number one. Number two, if somebody is willing to donate one, I'm always happy to accept. Anyway, um, I don't think the scanners are accurate enough to record a, a maxillofacial defect, you know, which can be really deep inside. So I'm, I would be very skeptical uh, if, you know, if these intraoral, these intraoral scanners are mainly made for scanning prep teeth, for, um, you know, using scan bodies for implants. They don't even recommend them for full mouth implants and all that. Some people say they use it, but I don't know if yeah. it is really. Accurate. I think three shape him themselves don't say that you know they can. It's reliable for more yeah. than two implants at a time. Exactly. But I know all the companies are doing it in India, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I don't think they are you know saying that it's reliable enough. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay for a single implant mm -hmm. or two implants, implants or something like that, maybe. Yeah. But I definitely don't think they are accurate enough to record a maxillofacial. I, I, I think a, a, a good impression. I don't think there is a substitute for it right now. Yeah, there's a That's study by Robert Nodelku, Robert Nedelku from Uppsala University. He's, uh, he's, that's his PhD topic. And he compared impressions accuracy with uh, digital versus conventional in a totally edentulous patient. And it showed that it is not of acceptable standards. Uh, yeah, edentulous, oh, okay. uh, edentulous is very difficult, actually. If you're, yeah, Robert Nedelku is the name. And he's done a lot of work on this. Mm. Uh, no, see, so, you, you have know, I can see that there are a lot of bad, the mouth, all of those problems, you know, that all those things you cannot record with a scanner. You can do it with an impression tray. What Sorry. I'm understanding with all this conversation is that since a lot of technology is creeping into the medical field and we are all getting very fascinated by this technology, but uh, uh, when it comes to outcomes, I think still... Uh, our own uh, skill as a surgeon, as a prosthodontist with our hands and observations are still very much in vogue. And I think we should still depend on uh, honing them and working on our knowledge rather than totally depending on 
technology for sale. Like like it's always so? said, let let's not be the first nor the last. Um, yeah. I was having a chat this morning with uh, Vinay, and Vinay's concern was uh, palpable. That he he said that the problem with um, uh, banding about experimental work, which is why which is why I started with a disclaimer, is that <clears throat> when we discuss somebody else's experimental work. First off, that experiment has to be uh, an extension of a current valid scientific proven uh, um, hypothesis. Yeah, second, yeah. mm -hmm. second, we have to understand that the patient needs full disclosure. Third, there should be no other option for that patient. These mm -hmm. things, oh, that's only when we can ethically, morally, scientifically justify anything where we push the envelope. Otherwise, we stick to gold standard. That is what we owe the patient. We cannot be adventurous on behalf of the patient. Uh, second point uh, regarding um, uh, the reason why I started this whole thing about occlusion is I think uh, it is very clear that uh, um, by default, we have chosen to be slow as far as uh, 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 developing our thought process regarding rehabilitation. But considering that we are the chaps who are um, trained in occlusion um, at our, at our uh, most basic thought levels, we should be the ones we should, who should be thinking of occlusion. And uh, with a little bit of, uh, so long as we are not dogmatic about everything, uh, if we choose cases well, I, I think uh, with the most importantly, what, what one thing I have learned is that um, I'm with a young prosthodontic lady who's brilliant. She loves the job. She's as committed as we are, if not more, <laughs> and the team works beautifully. And as long as you have a team and we all know uh, how, how and when we have to put a shoulder to the wheel, I think we are going to be fine. Sec um, uh, and most of all, let's respect the expertise of others. And so long as it yes. is that, I think we'll be just fine here. I think Dr. Rashmi has, we can take one last question. By can I, we can, we can. No, one uh, comment, please, can I make? See, yes. I'm not saying that scanners don't have a role. They do have a role. Um, you know, for um, for doing crown and bridge, um, you know, for um, single implant or two or three implant uh, implants with scan bodies, they have a role. So we shouldn't discount them completely. We shouldn't just start using them for every term, everything that we do. That's all. Sorry, Vinay, go ahead. No, I had nothing to. Yeah, no, there's a, there's uh, a question Adi, here. Adi, there's a, yeah, there's, there's question one last here. question. One last question. Mm -hmm. Any ways to take impressions with restricted mouth opening? Ah, uh, yes. Is that <laughs> a prosthodontist? Oh, is no, that? All right. she's a, no, she's a surgeon. She's a surgeon. She's a surgeon. Huh. Yeah. She's a yeah, surgeon, yeah, extremely yeah. difficult. See, that's why the heisters has to be used. You know? Uh, the, <clears> I, <throat> I see a lot of surgeons not giving enough importance to that. You know, patients come to me after a month, they have very limited mouth opening. I have to use the heisters and create excruciating pain for them. I feel really sad about it. But if the patient comes with one finger mouth opening, I can't do anything. Therefore, it is extremely important that two weeks post-op, the patient must start using a heisters or a therabyte. But I, I still feel uh, heisters is better. And especially if the patient is going to undergo radiation, they have to continue using this for the next four to six months. Now, if a patient comes with extreme fibrosis, there, there have been times when I have had to say sorry to the patient. I, I, can't, I can't make an impression. I can't make a process. Well, yes, um, I think yeah. we have to develop the luxury of ensuring that we have an equally competent prosthodontist by our side. And that's not going to happen if we are uh, working in separate verticals. Um, uh, since morning, the only thing that's uh, running in my head is, um, it's a shame, I, I, I should have actually asked my prosthodontist to log in as well, is how well intermeshed our practice has become. As Dr. Jacob is talking, I don't do implants even, but even so, I can I, I can imagine, I, I can start remembering the time when she started coming into the OT. Now she's a regular presence in the OT. She, she does lots of stuff after, uh, uh, lots of stuff after I finish, 
I mean, the coffee room and she's on and on with the patient and I'm asking her to wake him up. I don't know what they do, but they do a huge lot. And uh, Dr. Jacob has a lot of uh, history of working with MaxFax surgeons. And I think he's kind to, uh, being kind to a lot of us, but most of us take uh, prosthetic work for granted and we send them off at a later date. I, I think it's sensible to, especially for youngsters who are starting a practice, it's very sensible that you start a practice with an appropriate specialist. If they are interested in, in maxillofacial prosthetics. Oh, yes, yes, yes. If they are interested. That's a big if. Should we wind up, uh, Adi? Because I uh, think yes, we are already to, uh, yeah. The, am the amber coming. liquid beckons, Taranjit. Amber <laughs> liquid. <laughs> <laughs> it it was it was awesome. I think on behalf of all of it, I, I think I had a lovely time. I had a great time. I feel uh, my own knowledge is I, I feel so evolved after the story of evolution myself. So uh, and of course I have my own uh, mucor mycosis defect patients waiting and you guys are. Oh yes, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. I, uh... All, all the speakers I spoke earlier were right. It was, there was, it was impossible to bring in mucormycosis. That's another session in itself. Yes. So uh, I think we should leave it for another day. But yes. um, um, thanks, Taranjit. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Taranjit and Aditya. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Bye. Bye, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.